Okay, so yeah, briefly about myself, we run a firm. Uh, we're called Measuring Usability for 10 years, but we've done uh, a lot more than usability. We do market research, customer analytics, customer experience. So we're now going to be measuring you, um, but every, every, all the addresses still work if you're trying to find us. But we can be found online at measuringyou.com, or I'm, I'm on Twitter at measuring you. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 10 things you need to know about the system usability scale today. Uh, some things if you're unfamiliar with it as well as some things if you are familiar with it we're going to go into. So first and foremost, SUS is now 26 years old. This actually came out in 1986. This is the same year that you had green screen computers at Digital Equipment Corporation and the same year that Falco's Rock Me Amadeus was like topping the charts. And I don't know if you guys know that song, but it's, you know, it's just a classic 80s song. I'm going to make sure it's stuck in your head through the duration of this webinar as well here. So it's, it's an instrument actually developed by John Brook while he was at Digital Equipment Corporation. He's now since been retired, and he and I have corresponded over the years about this, but there was, it, it sort of was released into the wild uh, without a um, license fee, and so it's allowed a lot of researchers, uh, academic um, professionals to use it, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we've been able to take advantage of that. So he, here is the system usability scale. It's a 10-item instrument. An instrument is just a fancy way for uh, psychometricians to call a questionnaire or a form of a survey, but these 10 items were originally intended to be a quick and dirty, those were John Brooks' words, quick and dirty measure of system usability. And the reason why it's quick and dirty is because um, uh, psychometricians and um, statisticians generally like to have questionnaires that have more items because in general, when there's more items in a questionnaire, there's more reliability. And so more items, more reliability. So if it's shorter, by definition, it'll have less reliability. Um, but as anybody who knows, there's limited amount of time to both evaluate the perceived usability of a system as well as uh, the participant's time. So John came up with these 10 items, and the way that the general process works uh, of validating an instrument is you come up with a pool of items, say 30 or 40, that you think are going to measure the construct that you want to measure. In this case, that construct is usability. Um, and then through some pretests, you winnow that down to the items that correlate the best, that tend to be consistent, uh, that are in some way valid, that is, are corresponding to other measures. And so the original validation of the system usability scale uh, was used by identifying two systems, one with sort of known good usability based upon its bugs and problems and issues reported by a number of, of, of customers and users at Digital Equipment Corporation, and then a good system. And so these 10 items, effectively discriminated against those two and discrimination is a good thing when you're talking about psychometrics maybe not in real life but you want to be able to discriminate from good software and bad software good hardware and bad software so you've got these 10 items and you'll notice that they alternate from positive I think I would like to use this system frequently to negatively toned items I found this system unnecessarily complex um, they each have a um, uh, participants are asked to respond to this in this five-point scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. This is actually technically a Likert or Likert scale, however you want to pronounce it, um, but uh, Likert, Likert scales by definition have to be strongly disagree to strongly agree. So participants are asked to respond to this typically after a usability test. And the way that the scoring works is you basically have to reorient the negative items so they're positive and you scale everything so it goes from 0 to 100 uh, instead of from 0 to 40. Now, this is sort of arbitrary scaling, but what it does is it allows uh, scales to range from 0 to 100. And I think the original intent behind this was because it just it seems easier to interpret a 0 to 100. 100 is the highest, 0 is the lowest, and 0 to 40. Now, while that's good, um, it does introduce some problems here is that you know, the first thing you know about SUS is that those scores from 0 to 100 are not percentages. So that means that 50 is not average, while 100 is the best score you could possibly get, and 0 is, is the worst score you can get. Uh, what we found over the years is that, in fact, the average score is far from 50. It's, it's, it turns out to be 68. That's the, the, the second uh, thing to know about SUS. And this is one of the advantages of this being an open source scale that John Brook put out there is that over the years people have published what their score has been on a number of products, hardware, software, mobile phones, back when mobile phones weighed a lot more and did a lot less, uh, as well as more recently. 
so we looked at those 500 products, and again, this is in the Practical Guide to System Usability Scale, if you're interested in digging into that more. But we summarized that and found that, in fact, that the average score is a 68. And what the scale here shows you is that pretty much all the act action happens with SUS uh, between about a 60 and an 80. You go from a, basically a below average product, which is, if you wanted to give it gra a grade, is about a D plus or a D there, or a C minus. You go from 60 to an 80, or you're going to go from an A minus to an A. And basically, anything above an A is good. And so, um, an important thing to keep in mind, but, but this graph alone will allow you to convert these raw scores into something that is more meaningful. And what's nice is that's exactly what uh, my friends here at TriMyUI have included into the product, is the ability to turn raw SUS scores, score it automatically for you, and say, this product is actually scoring above the 75th percentile meaning it's better than 75% of, of these 500 uh, products in here, which would give it something like a B. So the third thing to know about SUS, which a lot of people sort of took for granted for a while, is that it, while it was originally intended to be a single dimensional measure of one construct, just usability, it was never subjected to the next layer of psychometric validation. Uh, and in that process, what you typically do is you take the responses participants give and you perform what's called a factor analysis. And a factor analysis looks for look at the correlation bes between items and tries to identify uh, late, what are called latent patterns or latent factors uh, to identify are there additional constructs. And um, what we did is we had enough data, so we went ahead and did the factor analysis, and we actually found even though it was intended to measure just one factor, one construct, there was evidence that there was actually two things being measured there. So we found that there was this factor of usability, what we called it, and a factor of learnability, and then there's an overall. And so it actually provides multiple measures. Um, and so this is sort of a bonus. Um, a lot of times when it, one thing you could do is you could drop those two items and say, okay, well, we just want system usability. So drop these two items that aren't doing a good job of measuring that. But you're not gaining much by going from 10 to 8, so might as well just keep those. And you could see down here the learnability items are for, I think that I need the support of the technical person, and I needed to learn a lot of things before I could get going. And so, again, also something that you can report out is that learnability as a separate aspect, which is basically summarizing these, provides it an additional level, level of um, diagnostics. Uh, I'm going to touch on a little bit of a technical topic here, but it's a, a question I get a lot, and it's something you'll notice as I touched on earlier about the alternating items from positive to negative. Part of the reason that's done is that if you take, and if, at least if you did, certainly in the 1980s and 1990s, take a class on developing instruments and psychometrics, the sort of fundamental thing, one of the sort of, sort of first things they, they teach you is that you want to reduce what are called acquiescent and extreme response bias. And you guys might be familiar with this if you've ever seen a participant um, race through and just sort of say five, 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 yes, yes, everything's great, everything's great. And you have to wonder, well, how, how much are they possibly reading and, and understanding these items that I spent so much time building? So one, a, one way of sort of getting the participant to think more is, is throwing in these alternating items to reduce these extreme response bias of always agreeing or just always acquiescing you know, fours or fives. So by alternating it, it forces the participant to sort of reconsider and change their responses. But as you might suspect, this sort of comes at a price, and that price is that, guess what, those participants are just as hurried, and just because you want them to spend time and consider your carefully worded items doesn't mean that they will. And um, it can introduce its own set of problems. And so this is what we call the dark side of alternating, the three Ms. Mistakes, misinterpreting, and miscoding. When we looked at those SUS questionnaires from uh, uh, across those 500 products, and we looked at some that were don donated to us, out of the 107, which we have this nice raw data, we found that 17% um, contained some type of internal consistency. That is, people were agreeing to both positive and negative items too much. And even more dis dis discouraging was that us researchers across the companies we're miscoding because if you forget to reorient the items from the negative ones to positive, you'll get a valid score, but it'll be an incorrect score. So you won't necessarily know unless you're paying attention. So that 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 presents a lot of problems. And the, the sort of conclusion here is that the reversing the items generally causes uh, more harm than good. 
And what we did is we created a all positive version of the sus. So we take negative items like I found the website unnecessarily complex, negatively worded, and turn it into I found the website to be simple. Um, and I found the website to be cumbersome to use, for example, I found the website very intuitive. So what we found is that this positive version of the sus had no more extreme response bias or acquiescent bias, the so-called reason for alternating in the first place. There was no evidence for at least that it was not showing up after measuring several hundred participants on both of these. So uh, there's a couple lessons learned here. Number one, if you're developing a new questionnaire, stay positive. I mean, it's generally good advice in life. You want to be a positive person, and that's also what you want to be when you're developing questionnaires. But the second thing is, is it's okay to keep using the SUS as we still keep using it. You just want to make sure you're checking your item codings especially well, and especially if you have a way of, of verifying that the users are actually um, scoring things properly. And again, this is something that's nice is that if you're using online software to score it, that gets taken care of for you. So you eliminate at least a couple of those M's. Um, and that's also the case that's going on with the, the Try My UI integration of SUS. So now we go on to the fifth thing to know about SUS. And this is in general about what the construct of usability as well. And if, if I sort of go high level here, Usability, there is, as many of you know, there's no usability thermometer. There's no magic usability yardstick that you can stick in software or websites and say, this is how usable something is. Instead, we rely on the outcome of good and bad experiences to measure the usability. And for all intents and purposes, it's operationalized usability as is a definition from what's been embodied in the ISO 9241 Part 11 definition of usability. That is, that's, it's some combination of the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction of users in a particular context while they attempt tasks. So effectiveness, can users complete tasks? Efficiency, can they do it quickly? Satisfaction, are they generally, is there positive affect while they're going about doing that? So in other words, you can't just have people doing tasks well and quickly. There's, there's a cognitive, emotional, and attitudinal aspect about that. So usability is the combination of attitudes and actions. And um, SUS, therefore, is one measure of that triumvirate. It's a measure of, of users' attitudes towards the system. It's never meant to be a replacement for performance-based metrics. And when you talk to John Brooke about when they came up with this questionnaire, they say, you know, we would watch participants in a usability study, we would clearly see problems, but then we would have a measure, an outcome measure of, well, how big of an impact is, are these problems possibly having? So you generally need both um, to get the most out of uh, understanding what's going on in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the user experience. And so that's why something like SUS, what's, when it's married to a more qualitative testing mechanism like what Try My UI, My UI is offering with being able to watch participants, this provides a nice layer of quantitative impact. So now if we kind of dig back down and think about this a little bit more, one consequence of measuring experiences that we find is that the familiarity breeds content, meaning the more experienced participants are with a website or with the software, the more the score tends to be inflated. So it's, it's SUS, like any measure, is not this sort of absolute, unchanging barometer of usability. It's affected by third variables or other variables that we sometimes we do when we don't want. And one of the strongest ones we see is this experience. And so what these graphs are showing you here is that, for example, all things being considered, we have people do the exact same tasks. And we just looked at one variable, both on websites and software, is that first-time users Average SUS scores across several websites, 764 people, was about a 61. But for participants who had actually been to the site before, their SUS score was about 10% higher. And we see a similar pattern when we look at software. That is, the more years of experience participants have, when we have them do the same set of tasks, we basically see an inflation in the SUS score. And so again, with the difference between participants with five years of experience and those with zero to three years of experience was about 10%. So what that means is that, effectively speaking, it's important to measure participants' prior experience with the website or software when you're understanding and working with metrics. This is the sort of metric minefield you have to deal with. Is, is In the same way you want to collect things like, say, gender and age, I think that's the sort of like demographic 101 that we all think about when we're including it in a survey, 
except we generally don't see a heck of a lot of difference between age and gender except in certain contexts or, or at the extremes, very young and very old. However, we almost always see differences in scores when we look at um, even subtle differences in experience like we're showing here, just a couple of years of experience. So when you want to make comparisons over time, you want to make sure, for example, that you have a, a comparable sample. So number six out of ten here things to uh, know about uh, SUS is that it predicts or at least is associated with customer loyalty. What I mean by that is that we've taken the popular and in some, some circles notorious net promoter score that uh, Fred Reichel and Satmetrics have developed and this is asking participants just one question, how likely is it that you are recommend the software or website to a, a friend or a colleague. What Fred and company over at Bain have found was that this one question was the best or second best predictor of a company's annual growth rate in 11 out of 14 industries. So there's a lot of qualifiers in there, but they said, you know what? Everybody doesn't have enough time to ask 50 questions. If you could only ask one question to predict future growth, what, what's the best one? And they said, this one's a pretty good, this net promoter score, how likely are to recommend a friend or colleague? And so participants or respondents who say nine or a 10 are dubbed promoters. Those that, uh, that respond with a seven or eight are not totally excited about it, but they're not dissatisfied. They're probably not telling people good things. They're considered passives. And then uh, participants who respond with a zero to six are, are, are coined detractors. These are respondents who are more likely to actually be dissuading and discouraging other people from using software. So a lot of companies use the Net Promoter Score. Probably a lot of you listening today use it. And when you use the Net Promoter Score, it's great as a, 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 what's called a dependent variable, a sort of a big outcome measure that's reasonably meaningful, especially in consumer settings to, uh, to customers, and as some proxy for growth or some proxy for generally good things for a company. But once you get a net promoter score, that, that's sort of step one. You don't stop. Like any measurement system, you don't measure for the sake of measuring, and you're less you're a stats geek like me. You measure for the purpose of improving. And so when you dig into to the net promoter score as to why people are or are not recommending quantitatively, what we have found is that users' perception of the usability of the software or the website ends up being a disproportionately large driver of customer loyalty. What we tend to find is that why are customers detracting? Well, for software websites and any many product experiences, it's because of the usability. How are we measuring usability? We're measuring it using the system usability scale. And so what I'm showing you in the graph in the lower left-hand corner here, for example, is we found across several products and several hundred users that, for example, the average SUS score of promoters was about an 80 or so, a little above an 80. And if you remember, that puts you in the A category. And so you can see the association here is that, okay, promoters go with a SUS score that's pretty high. And then it, conversely, detractors on average um, for products had SUS scores about 65. That's down in that sort of C, C minus category there, just, just a little bit below average. Um, will get you in the neighborhood of a detractor showing that High usability is no guarantee for promoters, but it is largely associated with that. And so what we found is in general, uh, the correlation is pretty high between usability and customer loyalty. This is often the case with a lot of these attitudinal measures, but it's generally pretty high as well. And um, what we found is that usability can usually explain between about 30 and 60% of the variance in customers' likelihood to recommend. And for those technically inclined, that's the adjusted R square value between 30 and 60%. Um, other factors are affecting likelihood to recommend. And as a shortcut we actually found is that you can actually predict the likelihood to recommend on this scale here by just dividing the SUS score by 10. So you take the SUS to say 80 and you um, divide it by 10. That means that the, your best estimate of the likelihood to recommend would be somewhere about an eight, uh, uh, somewhere in the passive range. So you want to be something like an 8081 is going to get you the, the sort of in the promoter category there. So when you look at data, one sort of concern people have is is the the distribution of, of the data when you want to start using statistics with it. 
So number seven is that thing about us is that the raw scores aren't normally distributed. That is, they're not symmetrically bell-shaped if any of you took a stats class, which is usually a precondition for using things like confidence intervals or t-tests. They're not normally distributed, which is often cause for alarm, especially when you graph it like I've got here. There's, this is what the SUS scores look like from participants we had go to budget.com and try and rent a car. Here's their SUS scores. So nothing about that is bell-shaped and symmetrical. However, um, this is a little bit more technical, but what's important about when you want to use statistics with SUS is not the distribution of the raw scores. It's the distribution of the sample means which needs to be normally distributed. And what that means is as you see down here, even at sample sizes of 8, 20, and 30, what I've taken here are a sample mean. That is, if we ran one study once, we got a sample mean of, say, something like 75. But then if we were to run that study again by just sort of randomly changing which participants we included, 8 in this case, the sample average is going to change a little bit. And what you then get is a nice normally distributed value, even for really small sample sizes. So that means you can use statistics just fine because the sample mean is generally normally distributed even for really small samples. As you can see here, eight. That's bell-shaped enough here that we can use those. So uh, another thing to think about. That sort of dovetails into the next question is you can actually use SUS on small sample sizes as well. So 10 items helps improve the reliability. We have a mean that's generally pretty stable. And what I've got here is just a resampling exercise where um, I took a sample size of just five, which is an, an often a, a score, you'll, a number of participants you'll see for a very small qualitative study. And I wanted to see how far off was a sample of five B from an actual SUS score of, of 311 people. So I had 311 SUS scores, and I said, well, what if I just randomly had picked five people and computed their SUS score? So on average, what this is showing that I would have been off about a score of about 50% um, uh, within 50% of the time within just a few points there. Whereas a 95% confidence interval, that's this red line showing here, I'd be off more like uh, 15 or, or 16 points there. And so half the time I'm going to nail it within five points. That means if I just run five people and I get a SUS score of 70, about half the time I feel pretty good that that score is actually going to be about between 75 and, and, and 65. So I'm sort of in the ballpark with just five people. I know I can rule out that it's a really good system or it's a really bad system. Now, typically when we put confidence intervals, we don't use 50% confidence intervals. We use 95% confidence intervals. And you can sort of see the price that you pay, that with small samples, you've got a good idea about the ballpark. But if you need to be really sure that it's not going to be below, say, 60 or 50, then you do need a larger sample size, and that's what the confidence interval tells you. But again, it still provides a reasonably stable measure, even with a very small sample size. So number nine of 10, I think, to know about SUS is that, it's again, as I touched on earlier, it's not meant to be a replacement for task-based usability study. It's not meant to be diagnostic. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use the SUS by itself and just measure SUS without having users um, take tasks. We do this all the time. We call them retrospective studies where we say, hey, we know you've been using this software. Can you answer these 10 SUS scores so we can say, okay, here, here's where it's falling. And we don't compare that necessarily to people who are then in a lab-based study. But we look at those people and say, okay, over time, how has, has SUS score changed? And we do this when it's difficult to test users. So if you have system administrators or expensive users or Wall Street traders or high, who knows that you can't get these people or, or physicians or, or hardware engineers that are not going to be able to sit for two hours and take a study or you can't get access to the system, but you know that they use it all the time. You can actually use the SUS as, as, as some idea of, of how acceptable the system is. This graph here, though, is showing how, while SUS is not meant to be diagnostic, it does correlate with task performance. And so generally speaking, as the SUS score goes up, so here's a SUS score of 40, 53, 61, um, here's each of the SUS scores, um, and then the completion rates that go along with it. So for example, on average, SUS scores in the 70 some odd range here were associated with completion rates of between 80 and 100%. So it's, it, you, could, you, you could sort of see, you, you, there's, you sort of asymptote out in terms of the completion rate, 
But then as you go down a little bit, stuff scores of, of below 70 and 60 are associated with much lower completion rates. Again, just showing you that there is a correlation between the attitude. It's not a perfect correlation. It's, it's a modest correlation between task and performance, but it is indicative of it. Um, so sort of finally, and it's one thing that is, is both an advantage and a disadvantage of SUS, is that it's technolo technology agnostic. And what that means is that you can use SUS, the questions are phrased in such a way that it works on hardware, software, websites, vo voice response systems, um, anything you want to test, for, uh, test where a participant or a user has an attitude towards the system. So this works particularly well if you're a company that has software and hardware and you want some nice standardized measurements. One disadvantage of, of, of this technology agnostic attribute is that it doesn't provide more specific questions for a specific technology, specifically websites. So we know, for example, websites, things like the participants' trust and credibility about the information, the payment systems, are important, and so is the visual appearance, as well as things like just navigating and finding things. In many cases, those are more important on websites. So it doesn't do that well. And, and part of that reason is why we developed another instrument, something called the SuperQ, uh, the Standardized User Experience Percentile Rank Questionnaire. We took SUS and said, well, can we just take a couple of these SUS items and measure usability and measure these other aspects of, use, of, of a, the sort of UX quality of a website uh, and the, with the same number of measures. And if we have time, we'll, we could talk about SuperQ later for websites. But what the SuperQ does is what the SUS does we go back and forth. You can measure a website with SUS. It provides a good measure of usability. We found though we could just take two items and predict SUS scores reasonably well. So you get almost a SUS score plus other measures of loyalty appearance um, and credibility with actually just eight items. So SUS is technology agnostic. Um, the second thing though is it is reliable. So even though uh, John Brook built this as a quick and dirty, it's actually, you could characterize it as a quick and clean. Um, questionnaire. It, it, it's pretty reliable, and reliability is measured in a number of ways. That the, one of the ways is, is, is participants' internal consistency, how they respond. Um, the internal reliability, measuring something called Chromebox Alpha, is pretty high. It's about as high and as high, actually, as other commercially available um, soft um, um, questionnaires like SUMI and WAMI. And so, what I've got here is a um, a correlation between SUS and uh, SUMI, and you can see this regression line here showing there's a, there's a very high correlation, meaning, in other words, that uh, SUS is, is, is showing what's, what's, what's called convergent validity with another instrument out there, or concurrent validity, depending on how you want to call it that. So there's evidence that it's quick, clean, meaning reliable, uh, and, uh, and a valid instrument. So there, there they are. Here's the 10 things that we just sort of talked about, Dave Letterman style there. So we talked about it, the raw scores from 0 to 100, but those are not percentages. An average score actually is 68. That's, a, that's more like a 50th percentile or a 50% there. We know it measures more than just an overall usability. We can break that down in terms of learnability as well. That reversing causes more harm than good, but because everybody uses us, we sort of are sticking with it, just making sure things are scored properly. Um, we, we know that prior experience is going to improve SUS scores, so measuring that is an important covariate. Usability is associated with customer loyalty, so you can, in effect, predict customer loyalty scores from SUS scores and vice versa. And even though the raw scores aren't normally distributed, the sample means are, which means you can use statistics on it without too much concern. And you could do that even on samples, uh, small sample sizes, and that's explained in more detail in the book. And SUS scores are not meant to be diagnostic, so when you get a SUS score, don't expect it to tell you what to fix. It's just going to give you a score, and so you're going to need at least open-ended questions, or when it's done in a usability test, you'll be looking to see what problems did participants have while they were um, used working with the system. And then finally, the technology agnostic attribute of SUS is, a, is sort of a, a, a good and a bad thing. You can measure it across products and websites, uh, but it doesn't provide specific things like for mobile devices or for websites like we've talked about. So that's what I got, and I'll leave it over or hand it back over to you guys for to, to talk a little bit more, and I'd be happy to answer questions. I covered covered a lot there.